You'll see that my style, this is a cultural issue too, my style is very different from Dr. Kellogg's. Um, Luther, our filmer, thinks we seem like sisters. So <laughs> I actually have an identical twin sister, so one of those is an... What I want to do is remind you of what you're assigned for my lecture as reading. You, some of you like dates and some of you don't, I suspect. But if you study culture, the Gregorian calendar is very handy to hang your hat on. Um, Dr. Kellogg has talked to us largely about the 16th century, in fact almost entirely about the 16th century. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the 17th and 18th and then we're going to converse a bit more, but I handed you, it's on your website, on the Blackboard site, a um, list of dates. It's a two-page document. Look familiar? I hope it does. The first page compares the Spanish and the English histories during the period that we're discussing, 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. Well, actually, I only go to the 17th. The reason I do that is because ordinarily I teach comparative Americas studies. We look at North and South and Central uh, America, or that sh I should say Anglo and Hispanic. America. So I'm interested in that. You may be less interested in the first page of this document. The second page I really count on your mastering. It's the version I put red and black <laughs> uh, codes for you. But if, if you don't, if you can't say in your sleep that it was 1521 when Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, was conquered, then, then probably you haven't studied this sheet enough. That you don't, I mean, you must know that it's almost exactly a hundred years later that, that Plymouth Rock is um, conquered by the Puritans, or I guess we would not say conquered in that case. So a hundred years difference. I want you to think, because you're studying in the U.S., think comparatively, even as we talk about Latin America, as I consider that I do. I was reared in the U.S. I came to uh, love Latin America as an adult, and it's very important for me to think uh, comparatively about my own culture in relationship to Latin America. So I give you those dates because I think they're important. Whether you'll be tested on them or not, I don't know, but to have a, a friendly feeling for the centuries is, I should say, almost uh, a requirement for cultural studies. The other document I gave you is a schematic history or a schematic version of art historical categories. It's up on the, the website. But when I talk about the Baroque, as I'm going to, as Fuentes does in the chapter that you've been assigned, you need to say 17th century in Europe, 1600s. So we're already talking about a century after Dr. Kellogg's uh, figures. And we're going to say that in now, Europe, 17th century, okay, 1600s is Baroque in Europe. In Latin America, it comes later and it lasts longer. I'm going to talk to you more about what the Baroque is and what it looks like, but first I just want you to get it straight that you can say the Baroque in Latin America goes from 1640, more or less the middle of the 17th century, through almost the 19th, late 18th. I'm going to show you some pictures of that in a minute. So these seem like, you know, high school, whatever, I don't know, dates and charts aren't too popular these days, but for me, they're the basis for understanding the time frame that our cultural conversation is about. So if you could take a look at those, and then I've asked you to read, and it's up on your website, a short chapter called The Baroque, new, the, the Baroque Culture of the New World from the Buried Mirror. If you should ever take the introduction to Latin American studies, which Dr. Kellogg and I have actually created as a course, you will see that you're going to be asked to look at much of this Carlos Fuentes book. It's very readable. It's a history based on cultural production that is largely visible. That would be painting. There's talk of literature, of course, but painting and architecture. So, and it's wildly well illustrated. I think it began as a BBC television show. It may be a little light, L-I-T-E, for some scholars. For my purposes, it's a wonderful introduction to a number of issues, including the Baroque in the New World. So let's look at what 
let's look at two examples that Fuentes gives as examples of transculturated Baroque. The Baroque is, comes from Europe, it's imposed upon indigenous populations, it's imposed as a Catholic counter-reformation aesthetic, it has an ideology pushing it, which we don't really have a lot of time to get into, but it, this was a Catholic conquest. It was, we could say conquest was always justified by conversion. Oh, the Spaniards, of course, they have every right to take over indigenous peoples and their cultures because the truth is theirs for the taking. That is, they we're going to preach the true religion, Catholicism, to indigenous peoples. And so we see that art and cultural production of all sorts, architecture is used for ideological purposes. Um, that's probably nothing uh, that surprises you, but it was very overt, the Baroque was very much a, an instrument of colonization and an instrument of conversion. Does Fuentes celebrate this in his chapter? Yes, he does, as you know. He says, aha, when the Baroque became transformed in the New World, that was our counter-conquest. We took their fo forms and we made them ours. The term counter-conquest is one of my favorites that I owe, we owe it to Lesama Lima, uh, a Cuban writer who writes about the Baroque, the transculturated New World Baroque, and says, ah, what we did was we counter, we conquered the conquerors because we produced something that was better and more ebullient and more energetic than uh, what they brought us in the first place. So let's look what, Fuentes follows this argument of counter-conquest, as you know, and I'm going to ask you to turn in your text, which I hope you will have printed out. I, I do tell my literature students uh, that I think it's a good idea. I'm still into print culture to some extent because then you can mark up in the margins the, the, the short texts that are required of you. If you'll turn to page 196, we have the first of two examples of architecture that Fuentes gives to say this is our counter-conquest. This is the uh, Indo-Afro-Iberian Baroque that symbolizes a mestizo culture, a culture of mixing that makes us, the culture that has become Mexico is greater than the sum of its parts. He says, there's no way that you can say that indigenous cultures weren't changed, but as Sue was just saying a minute ago, the world was changed by indigenous cultures. So he says, who conquered whom? That's what he's saying here. We can decide for ourselves, but I just wanted to show you the Baroque examples. It's the middle of page 196, and it's about the church uh, built by a, an indigenous Peruvian architect, in fact, decorated more than built, because indigenous labor was used, of course, throughout. But this is an example, and you'll see it on the, your screen, of uh, a church in San, Luis, San Lorenzo. It's called San Lorenzo Potosí, in, in Potosí, in uh, what was Alto Peru, now Bolivia. And you'll see a very decorated facade, and look what Fuentes says. It start, the paragraph that starts, in the Indian quarter of a great mining capital of Potosí, by the way, the Baroque always flourished where there were minerals, mines. Why? Because that was money. The Baroque is very ornate, as you'll see, uh, gold leaf covering altars and so forth. So this is not, we're not surprised that this is a mining capital. We're going to see a Brazilian example, same thing, mining area. The great mining capital of Potosí hearsay has it that once lived an orphan Indian, you see a great deal of legend is creeping in here, once lived an orphan Indian from the tropical lowlands of the Chaco. According to myth, he went by the name of José Condori. And in Potosí, he learned to work wood in the crafts of inlaying and furniture building. By 1728, we're already in the 18th century, 1728, this self-taught Indian architect was constructing the magnificent churches of Potosí, surely the greatest illustration of the meaning of the Baroque in Latin America. Now what he means by that is the mestizo, the mixed nature of the Baroque 
in Latin America. Among the angels in the vines of the facade of, and now here's the facade, you see it here. I, I know pointing at the screen isn't very helpful, but um, I'm going to show you a closer up of the facade, that indented, decorated, almost altar-like entrance uh, to what is otherwise a fairly rectangular and uh, simple building. The decorations on facades in the New World Baroque is always more exuberant than the structure of the building itself, oh, except for Brazilian Baroque, which we're going to see in a minute. Let's keep on with Fuentes here. Now, the, this, is, this is an ideological position that he's presenting to you. You may say, look, I, I'm, I'm not going to agree that mixings of cultures in Latin America produce such a great thing, think of all the downsides, and so forth, but let's go with his argument for the moment. Among the angels in the vines of the facade of San Lorenzo, an Indian princess appears. Now, look on either side of the doorway arch, and I'm going to show you the detail of these Indian princesses. There are more than one. Well, I'm going to go back. These examples are not the ones with the little arms out. Now I don't see them. Where are they? Oh, they're right beside the door frames. They're on the door arches. Sorry, my first detail of this facade is on either side of the door. Look at these figures. Fuentes finds these fascinating. He says, all of the symbols of the defeated Inca culture are given a new lease on life. Then he goes on and talks about a, other details, but let me just show you the other figures. These are super not European Baroque. If you saw these, you'd say this, ha this has to be someplace in the Americas if you have an eye for it at all. So look again at this. Uh, this wonderful archangel up at the top uh, above the uh, door frame is in Fuentes' book. Unfortunately, I didn't have that copied when I uh, made the PDF. I wish I had. You'll see very intricate work there, but you can see it almost in my more or less decent slides. Um, but what does he say? Caryatids are the things in Greek temples that hold up weight. They're often on pillars. They're not really weight-bearing. They pretend to be. He says, these aren't caryatids. These are indiatids. Indiatides, he says. These are indiatids, meaning this is something that is so transformed by the indigenous hands and the indigenous condori that now we have something that, well, we've reconquered. We've reconquered Europe. So it's a discourse. It's a 20th century discourse. Do we know what Condordi thought? Do we think that he thought that he was just showing those Europeans how much better than they, he, wa he, he was? I don't think so. But the 20th century and 21st century discourse is that the New World Baroque is a retort to Europe, not a reflection of it that the indigenous hand here is very visible in the European form. So a transculturated form, a syncretic form, and that word I do think is worth thinking about, S-Y-N-C-R-E-T-I-C, -E syncretic. Synthetic is something else, synthesizes to put together. Syncretic means that two cultures exist simultaneously and one culture uses the other culture's forms one culture's content is another culture's form. It doesn't mean they've mixed yet. I would say this is transculturated, but syncretic may not be a bad word to use for this as well. We see both cultures hanging in suspension, in a way. Now, turn the page, will you? Turn two pages, and another artist, architect, that Fuentes focuses on for the very same reasons. Ale Chardinho which means his full name, top of page 201, is Antonio Francisco Lisboa. He was the son of a Portuguese gentleman, architect, and also and he, he, that was his father, and his mother was a, an African slave in Brazil. So he was uh, of dual race. Let me read, let, together, take your, take your text and look at it with me, page 201. See what he says about Ale Chardinho. Ale Chardinho is known, as you know from reading your text, uh, as little cripple, that's what the word means, because he had leprosy. At the end of his life, he died in 1804. He goes even into the 19th century. These are, we're going to see our late 18th century. Um, 
he had to have chisels, so the legend goes. It seems there are more churches decorated by Ali Shadino than any human could possibly do, much less one who had to have chisels put onto his, tied onto his wrists. But I would just, in this area, uh, recently, and the legend is, is everywhere. So what's fabulous is the materials. Well, I happen to love the Baroque, as you can already tell, so I get very excited about the beauty and the exuberance, the dynamism. The Baroque isn't the neoclassical. Think of cap the capital in Washington, D.C. Think of, think of our national architecture. It's not Baroque. We're born after the Baroque as a nation, the U.S. We're neoclassical. So you have the Supreme Court with all of those square. We might as well be the Parthenon, you see? So that's what neoclassical style, that's 19th century. This is 17th and 18th, before the US really starts building its monuments. When did we build? The Capitol was still under construction during the Civil War, keep that in mind. We're a little late on the neoclassical, but we're a neoclassical culture, not a Baroque culture. Look at what um, Fuentes says about Ali Shadino. It's the first full paragraph, top of page uh, 201. I'm looking at my watch, that's a good sign. <laughs> there the mulatto Antonio Francisco Lisboa, known as Ale Chardinho, wrought what many consider the culmination of the Latin American Baroque. The son of a black slave woman and a white Portuguese architect, Ale Chardinho was shunned by both of his parents and the world. The young man suffered from leprosy. So instead of seeking the society of men and women, he joined a Baroque society of stone. Fuentes is a novelist, that's a poetic term, but he's going to, sh we're going to show you the statues that he made. There are pictures on the next page of your text. I'm going to show them all to you uh, in a minute. Um, but let's just keep on reading. This Baroque society of stone, a nice turn of phrase, you have to admit. I, I think it's quite nice anyway. The 12 statues of the prophets he carved in the staircase leading up to the church of the good child of Congonias do Campo reject the symmetry of classical sculpture. This is Oro Preto. It's one of his great masterpieces. It's the San Francisco in Oro Preto. But now let's look at the church he's talking about. Here it is, Congonias do Campo. He says it rejects the symmetry of classical sculpture. The Baroque is the opposite of the Parthenon in many ways, and it's the opposite of the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial and the Capitol. Like Bernini's Italian figures, but how absolutely remote from them geographically, these are three-dimensional moving statues rushing down toward the spectator. They're rebellious statues twi twisted in mystical anguish and human anger. And then he goes on about the Baroque a bit more. I want to show you the statues and I'm going to tell you which they are. First, let me go back here and tell you the dates. I, I'm into dates, I'm sorry. It's 1766 to 94. 1766 to 1794. So the last three decades, say, of the um, 18th century. This at the time when the U.S. was being constituted. 1766, this is 1776, we all know, is the Declaration of independence. So, so nation building in the North, Anglo North, uh, already great monuments of Catholic Baroque uh, architecture in, in Portuguese uh, America, Brazil. So this is St. Francis, uh, Church of Saint San Francisco, St. Francis in Ordo Preto. Ordo Preto, the great mining capital of Brazil. Ordo Preto means black gold. And it wasn't referring to oil, <laughs> it was referring to veins of gold. Okay, so we look at these quickly, and then I think probably Sue and I should chat, and then we're, we're holding you too long, I think. Um, the sculpting of stone is, is fabulous. There's a, a soapstone in the area of Brazil that's inland, uh, north, let's see, northwest of Rio, which is on the coast. Um, the soapstone is soft when it's taken out of the ground and it hardens over time. So it's perfect for sculpting in that it's not hard, hard, but then it hardens so it's perfect for staying. And the detail, as you see, okay, I'm just going to tell you, there are eight prophets. As I, each of them holds a scroll. This one is Daniel. We know it because he's got a lion as his attribute. And that's a term of science. That, what, what, um, 
identifies saints according to their, their lives. If we didn't know for sure that Daniel had, had fought in the lion's den, uh, we would know because on the scroll he holds, there's a, there's a statement from the, the text, the, the, the book of Daniel. This is the case with the rest. Here's Jonah. Oops, that's not Jonah. Hmm, what happened to Jonah? There's Jonah. Look at that whale down at his feet. See, I depend on the whale and the, and the, the, uh, the, the lion. Again, with the scroll, again, we know who, who he is. Beautiful sculpting. You can see the church in the background. But the idea of having these saints coming down, marching as if to embrace the worshiper coming up the stairs into the church is very dramatic. Um, this is, oh boy, this is Amos, so this must be Isaiah. Aha, yes. A couple of the statues don't have pupils in their eyes. It makes them look even more visionary, I think, as if they're staring. Uh, it makes them look a little blind, if you really think about it. But I think the idea behind Ale Shadino's uh, faces is to, to make these fellows who received the Word of God, who gave it to us in the Old Testament, uh, look as uh, powerful and yet as otherworldly as possible. And here another, this is Amos, and I'll show you a detail of Amos's, uh, the statue of Amos. And this last one, Naum, N-A-H-U-M, a minor prophet, but in the uh, Old Testament. Uh, so anyway, there we're back now to uh, San Lorenzo Potosi on the other side of South America, and then ultimately uh, to nothing. So that I, it's too too little time to go over too much. As you see in this chapter, Fuentes goes on to talk about Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, the great Baroque poet, lived in the last half of the 17th century. And he, he then speaks of other, of other aspects of the Baroque uh, in the New World, including the indigenous rebellions. He ends his chapter with Tupac Amaru. But I'm counting on you to have read that. We don't have time to go into it. What I want to do is finish up a little bit with the conversation with, with Sue and the ways in which possibly the Baroque as it's revalorized and recodified in the 20th century and 21st as a counter-conquest is perhaps too friendly to what the actual processes of building those churches was about. I think it's such a complicated issue to... I, I find the concept of uh, counter-conquest very interesting. There are historians who have... they don't tend to use that term too much. But there, there are historians who talk about, for example, conquerors conquered, um, mm -hmm. particularly in relation to religion and the so-called spiritual conquest, yes. in which priests, for example, had to use indigenous language in order to teach about Catholicism. And in the process of translating Catholic concepts, the concepts become changed, yes, sometimes right. so much that they're hardly recognizable. Yes. Um, so I, I certainly think there is a sense in which in, in, ev in the everyday life of the colonial period, um, there, there were all sorts of ways in which conquest and colonialism were undermined, changed, mm -hmm. shifted. On the other hand, coming back to my point about power, I think when we talk about counter-conquest, it slips pretty, which we certainly can see as an artistic and as a cultural process yes, sure. during the 17th and 18th centuries. Right. And today, when you go to Mexico, the minute you begin to walk the streets, it's such a different form of Western civilization as a absolutely, Catholic, absolutely that we can't. It's so different from Spain, from Portugal, that one has to say that there was an incredible dynamic of cultural. Um, contact and mixing that makes it a wonderful place to visit today. Unfortunately, the violence uh, due to drug issues is, is terrible at the moment, but not in all parts of Mexico. Nonetheless, along the U.S. border, it is unfortunately very bad. But um, yeah, so so this 
so then if we try to translate these concepts, whatever we wish to call them among the many terms that we've uh, played with, let's mm -hmm. say, um, can we apply it to U.S. culture today to change the subject radically? What would you say? Could we talk about transculturation today in Houston, Texas, Ooh, for example? That's a really good question. I think the extent to which the concept of transculturation is relevant to talking about American culture depends where, very much about where you're talking about and what you're talking about. I do not think that American culture, and here I'm just generalizing broadly in a U.S. historian or a scholar of American culture might have something different to say. I don't think you see transculturation in America, in North American, U.S. or Canadian culture anywhere to the extent that you see it really throughout Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I think when you're in the Southwest, you do see it. The Southwest is an exception. And the other way I really think you, I, the, the other way in which I think American culture has been shaped through transculturation is through the interaction of um, African American culture and cultural uh, forms yes, and there practices. There we can talk about New Orleans. With, <laughs> um, with I, don't, I don't know how to say it exactly, sort of dominant non-African American yeah, culture. Yeah, we used to be able to say mainstream and mean it, but now we've become so diverse, I think, right. in so many ways that right. the mainstream is hard to assert. On the other hand, I think part, I, it's a kind of loaded question I ask you because I think part of the reason that Fuentes and Paz both and Le Sama before are so willing to, to celebrate mixing is because they're really thumbing their nose at the U.S., where we mm -hmm. have been mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. of a, not a, we, we say melting pot, but the idea is we melt into a mainstream model. We don't, you know, really after two generations you shouldn't speak the mother tongue any longer. That's changed, I think, a lot. But in the time I was growing up, it was, and even when I first came to the University of Houston, I remember having Latino students in my, I taught Spanish for a little while, and I thought, oh boy, that's great. And no, they've been discouraged from speaking mm -hmm. Spanish mm -hmm. at home. So I, I think in lots of ways, Fuentes, he, he's certainly not just thumbing his nose at a U.S. audience, but I think he's saying we are very different from Anglo-America in this way. Uh, we, we, we've embraced our indigenous peoples, sometimes rudely and even fatally, but we didn't send them to the outer darkness. That's what, what Octavio Paz says. You'll laugh when, you, when I say this. He says in The Labyrinth of Solitude, but we were better to our indigenous populations than you were because we at least tried to convert them and we better or worse, I don't know. Our histories with our indigenous peoples are very different because Catholic and Protestant attitudes are very different toward inclusion. And, and you will get a little sense of Octavio Paz because I assigned a few pages from Labyrinth oh, of Solid yeah. Solitude, but pages from the chapter uh, La -La -La. about La Malinche. Yeah. Um, I th it, it is interesting to think about Fuentes and Latin American writers thinking about and talking about transculturation, transculturation syncretism, whatever set of terms we, we want to use, in relation to asserting the um, incredible cultural creativity and vitality of Latin American culture in relation to North American culture. And in that sense, the cultural so the, the celebration of this culture certainly makes a lot of mm -hmm. ma makes a lot of sense, and you can see where Fuentes is coming from yeah, right. in in doing that and making those kinds of assertions. For me, thinking about the historical questions in play, yeah. it's hard to feel completely comfortable Comfort with this yeah. notion of uh, counter-conquest. On the other hand, looking at, looking at that issue from the aspect of cultural production mm -hmm. more than from the aspect of historical events and everyday life during mm -hmm. different historical periods, um, because I think many of the workers who were producing this incredible right. er, uh, art um, were working under conditions, terrible conditions. Uh, under mm -hmm. terrible conditions that, you know, conditions like the people who are making iPads in China, you know, that, w that we really should be aware of yes, and, right. and thinking about and just not forget. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think Fuentes does a good job of noticing the injustice at the same time that he celebrates 
not having just reflected as in a mirror image Europe. So he's, he's himself walking a kind of mm -hmm. tightrope because mm -hmm. it's certainly mm -hmm. aware mm -hmm. of the...